you have your Bible this morning, I hope that you do, would you open your Bible with, with me to Mark chapter 14? We're going to look at verses 32 through 42 this morning as we continue reading through and studying the New Testament this year. I want to talk to you about a place called Gethsemane. While you're turning there in your Bible, uh, I, I think we would, uh, it would be wrong for us not to pause again as we did last Sunday and have a special time of prayer uh, for the people in Ukraine. Uh, I know our hearts are still very heavy about what's going on there, and we serve a mighty God, and we just need to pray that God would bring an end to this awful uh, conflict. So uh, before we dive into the Bible, let's, let's just take a moment and spend another uh, day uh, lifting the people up. Would you join me? Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again this week and we continue to pray with our hearts for the people of the Ukraine. Uh, Father, every week we see images of war that are horrifying, that cause us to have great pain in our heart, God. There is real suffering that is going on as a result of this conflict. And God, it is wrong. And we pray, O oh Lord, God, to heaven. You are the great and mighty God. There is nothing you cannot do. And, oh God, we would pray that you would bring an end to this conflict. We pray that you would change the heart of, of Putin. We pray, God, that you would cause the Russian soldiers to have no desire to fight this war. Uh, we pray, God, that, that in amazing ways, in a supernatural way, that, God, you would, you would bring it to an end. Watch over the people, the families, the children, the many that are suffering as a result of this war. For those that are fleeing and, and, fam and being taken in by other countries, we pray they'll get care and love. We pray, Father, for those that are injured, that they'll get treatment. And we pray, Father, for all the leaders of the world, God, for our president, for all the other leaders that are making uh, decisions in the midst of this conflict, that you give them wisdom and understanding. We pray for the churches that are there in the Ukraine, the pastors, the missionaries. May they be able to use this awful thing to bring people to Christ, to minister and show the love of Jesus. May the gospel continue to spread and grow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible there to Mark 14, verse 32 through 42, I want to talk to you about a place called Gethsemane. I think that uh, we all have Gethsemane moments in our life. Have you ever had a time in your life when you were praying about doing the will of God, that you, you knew something or you felt like something was the will of God, but, but you knew it was not going to be easy? You knew that doing the will of God was going to be very difficult, it was going to be very hard, and you're, you're struggling with that, you're praying through that. God, do you want me to do this? But, but you're in your, maybe in your heart you're thinking, I don't want to do this. <laughs> maybe in your mind you're, 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 you're battling with God and saying, God, this is, this is not what I, I desire to do. Well, I, I believe that in every believer, we do have Gethsemane moments. A Gethsemane moment are, are those times where we're, we're going to pray and seek God. And, and here's the deal. We're going to make a decision either to submit to God or to go our own way. We're either going to surrender to God and go toward God's will or we're going to choose not to. We're going to choose to go our own way. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ is a great example to follow. After three years of public ministry, he is about to face the hardest thing that any human being has ever faced in the history of the world. He was about to go to Jerusalem to die on a cross for me and you. He was going to suffer, take nails into his hands and feet, be spit upon, be mocked, be rejected. But even more than that, a sinless man who had never sinned, on that cross, was going to take on the sins of the whole world. All of our sins and all the sins of the world were going to be placed upon him on that cross. 
And he knew that it was God's will for him to go to the cross. But who would ever want to go through what he went through? And so it was in the Garden of Gethsemane, a beautiful garden that is there just outside the gates of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. It was in that beautiful garden of of these ancient olive trees. Do you know the Garden of Gethsemane today? They say that some of the olive trees in that garden date back to almost the time of Christ. Those trees are almost 2,000 years old. And they still bear olives today. And it was in that beautiful garden at the Mount of Olives where Jesus often went. He, he, was, he loved the Mount of Olives. He, he went there to pray. He went there for times of silence and solitude. And it was in that garden that he went to pray. And I think he had the most intense battle with Satan that he ever had. I know he, he battled with Satan at the beginning of his ministry when he went to the mountain of temptation. But I believe it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he had his greatest conflict with Satan. He knew the Father's will would not be easy. And he literally prayed that this cup would pass from him. He prayed three times. But he also said, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And so the main idea I want to share with you this morning, as we think about Jesus praying in earnest at the Garden of Gethsemane and surrendering completely the Father's will. The main idea I want to share with you is that God's will is not always easy, but it's always best. God's will is not always easy. It never will be, but it is always best. Would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word? And follow along with me in your Bible as I read Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 32. After the disciples had had that last supper together, they had the last supper, the Lord's Supper. Then they went out and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. But he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that this hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found the disciples sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Our Heavenly Father, this is your word. It is holy and true. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear today what your spirit would say to your church this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Indeed, God's will is not always easy, but it's always best. If you want to do God's will for your life, come in here. If you want to do God's will for your life, you got to know that it's not always easy. And that's the way God makes it. I, I, I mean, think about all through the Bible when Abraham was called to go out to a country not knowing where he was going so that God could make of him a great nation Abraham didn't know where he was going. He had to go. He had to leave his family not knowing where he was going. That was not easy. That was not easy to just step out in faith and leave everything not knowing where you're going. When God called Noah to build an ark on dry land and there was no water anywhere in sight and he was going to spend years building an ark and everybody was going to make fun of him, I mean, that was not easy. He was going to take his whole life and, and build an ark on dry land. I mean, that, that didn't make sense unless you had faith in God. Doing God's will for Noah was not easy. When you think about um, 
You think about Moses, and God called Moses to go back to Egypt when he was wanted there for, for a crime that he committed. And he knew if he went back, he faced being arrested or even worse. And God said, I want you to go back to Egypt and set my people free. Uh, that, that wasn't easy. God's will for Moses to go back to Egypt and do something that had never been done was not easy. I mean, we could go on all through the Bible. The Apostle Paul. God called the Apostle Paul to go on missionary journeys at a time when going on missionary journey was very dangerous, very treacherous. There was lots of persecution in the world. And yet Paul faced that, that Gethsemane moment to knowing that to do the will of God would not be easy. Well, there are four things I want you to notice with me in our text this morning that we learned from Jesus. Number one is this. There are times when your struggle is real. Right here, Jesus' struggle is real. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, notice the words it says in the Bible. It, it, it says there in verse 33 that he, was, he said that he was greatly distressed and troubled. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was greatly distressed. He was greatly troubled. He said to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Jesus was struggling. The struggle was real. I, I believe that when he began his ministry for three years, uh, he lived with this every day. How, how would you like to start a ministry and know that your ministry is only going to be a three-year ministry and at the end of the three-year ministry, you are going to be killed in a very horrible way. And he lived knowing that. In John chapter 12, we have what I call the Gethsemane before Gethsemane. This happened earlier. There were some Greeks that wanted to see Jesus. Not Jews, but Greeks. And, and the disciples didn't know what to do. They took the Greeks to Andrew. And Andrew said, well, I'm going I'm to take them to Jesus. And Andrew came to Jesus and said, hey, there's some Greeks that wish to see you. Well, that reminded Jesus of what he had to do so that all the world, all people of all nations could be saved. And the Bible says in John 12, verse 27, that Jesus said, now is my soul troubled. You know, if that was a statement coming from some uh, other person, it might not move me the way it does coming from Jesus. This was the Son of God. This was Jesus. And Jesus says, my soul is troubled. Sometimes we go through times our soul is troubled. And you might think, well, hey, if my soul is troubled, that's not very spiritual. Really? Are, are you telling me that Jesus wasn't very spiritual when he said, my soul is troubled? No, he was the most spiritual man that ever walked on this earth. He was the Son of God. He had never sinned. It, it, there are times that even in our spiritual maturity, in our faith, we're going to be troubled. We're, we're going to go through times that are going to be difficult and challenging. And it's okay to be troubled. And Jesus said, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? And then he said this, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? <laughs> I mean, that's what I'd like to say, right? Hey, save me from this. But he says, but for this purpose, I came. He realizes that this was the very reason he came to earth. And he said, Father, glorify thy name. And a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Oh, I love that prayer of Jesus. That's the Gethsemane before Gethsemane. His soul is troubled. He doesn't know what to pray. Have you ever been so troubled in your heart you just didn't know what to pray? Have you been there? I mean, your spirit is so troubled you really don't know what to pray. You're just trying to think of what do I pray here? What do I pray here? Well, you're in good company. That's where Jesus was. Jesus said, I don't know what to pray. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? And then Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. That's a great prayer to pray when you don't know what to pray. When your soul is so troubled, you have no idea what to pray. Let me give you a prayer to pray that will always work. Father, glorify thy name. 
And the father answered that prayer, didn't he? He he was proud. He said, my son, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again in you. And here again at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is battling the same thing. Luke tells us in Luke twenty two forty four that he was in such agony that he prayed earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was in such agony, he went into a state of, of physical uh, health that doctors call hematidrosis. It's when you are under such stress that the capillaries uh, of your, your body begin to bust open and, and the blood mixes with your sweat and you begin to literally sweat drops of blood. And such a thing could, would be very exhausting, would wear you out, could even bring you into a point of shock. And that's what Jesus experienced even before he went to the cross. Why was Jesus in such agony? Was he afraid of the nails? Was he afraid of the crown of thorns? Was he afraid of the beating of the Roman soldier? Well, I'm sure as a man, as a human being, he did not look forward to those things. But I think the thing that was most troubling for him was not the physical suffering. It was the reality that that something he had never experienced, he was about to experience. A man who had never sinned was about to experience everyone's sin, including mine and including yours. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In him who knew no sin, Jesus, he became sin. He took our sin so that our sins could be taken away and we could become the righteous of God in him. It was at that moment on the cross when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That your sin and my sin and the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus Christ. John MacArthur says in his commentary, listen, we cannot comprehend the depth of Jesus' agony because a sinless and holy, as a sinless and holy God incarnate, he was able to perceive the horror of sin in a way that we cannot. He knew the horror of sin in a way that we would never know it. Therefore, even to attempt to understand the suffering of Jesus that night on the Mount of Olives is to tread on holy ground. The mystery is too profound for us to comprehend. And even for angels, we can only stand in awe of the God-man. His struggle was real. There will be times that our struggle is real when it comes to doing the will of God. Notice the second thing. There are times when your support is weak. You would think that at times when your struggle is real that people who love you would come and support you. (laughs) But so often they don't understand your struggle. They don't understand what you're going through. They, They can't understand it. They can't fathom it. Just like Jesus. I mean here Jesus is with... Uh, the disciples, and he takes his three closest companions, Peter and James and John, and he said, come and pray with me. Would you come and watch with me? And, and he, he's really needing that them, his best friends, to pray with him. And, 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 he, and he goes off and he prays and he comes back and he doesn't find them supporting him. He doesn't find them pouring out their hearts for him. What are they doing? They fell asleep. They fell asleep. You see, they couldn't comprehend what agony it was like all through the ministry of Jesus. If you go back to Mark chapter 8, in Mark 8, you'll remember reading this. After Peter had given that profession of faith and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Bible says in Mark 8, 31, that he began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And he will be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. (laughs) It says he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
Peter rebukes Jesus. And it says but turning aside, uh, that Peter took him aside and rebuked him. But turning and seeing that his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter said, no, this is not God's will for you. You're not going to suffer and die. This is not God's will for you. Sometimes when you want to do God's will, when you know what God's will is, those that are the closest to you will tell you, no, that's not God's will for you. They think they're doing it out of love. They think that they're telling you not to go not knowing where you're going. Don't build that boat on dry land. Don't go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let all his free laborers go. I mean, none of that makes sense, does it? You're a crazy man to build a boat on dry land. You've lost your mind if you think you can go to Pharaoh without an army and get him to let all of his people go free. You're you're nuts if you quit your job and go somewhere not knowing where you're going. But the difference was for all of those, that was God's plan. That was God's will. That's what they were, God was calling them to do. And their closest loved ones could never understand it. Their closest loved ones would would have not have understood what they were doing because it made no sense. And there are times that we will be in a situation where doing God's will won't make any sense to anybody but us. And even those around us may discourage us from doing the will of God. Third, there are times when your submission is hard. Jesus prayed three times for the cup to pass. He did. Three times he said, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But all three times he said, what? Thy will be done. Thy will be done. That's hard. Reminds me of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Bible says the Apostle Paul had been given a thorn in the flesh. Now, we are not told what that thorn is. But it was painful. Paul said it was painful. He's a godly man. He's a missionary. He's a great man of God. Why would God give him a thorn in the flesh? Paul said it was painful. And you know what Paul did? I think he followed the example of Jesus. (laughs) He prayed three times, just like Jesus. And he prayed, Father, remove this thorn. It hurts. It's painful. I don't understand. Father, remove this thorn. It's okay to ask. There's nothing wrong with asking for God to remove a cup or remove a thorn. Jesus did it. Paul did it. They're a great example. Sometimes God may say, yes, I will. I'm going to remove that thorn. But that's not what God told the apostle Paul. In Acts 12, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 and 9, Paul said, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. He submitted to the thorn. He said, if your power is going to be in me as a result of that thorn, then I I submit to your will, God. You see, there's action submission and there's attitude submission. When Jesus submitted to go to the cross, that was an action. When Paul submitted to, I'm going to wear this thorn, I mean, he didn't have any action there because there was nothing he could do about it, but he changed his attitude. He said, well, I'm not going to walk around and be down and bitter and discouraged. I'm going to rejoice because you told me that your grace would be sufficient for me. Sometimes submission is hard to the will of God. But last, there are times when your surrender is everything. There are times when your surrender is everything. I I love it here. If we look at the last uh, two verses, it said in verse 41, he came back and they were sleeping again. And he said, he said, it is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let Let us rise and be going. He surrendered, didn't he? He said, the hour has come. 
There are going to be a time when you are struggling with the will of God. You are. And you're either going to surrender or you're going to go your way. And listen to me now. There's going to be a time when the hour has come, when a decision has got to be made. You can't keep putting it off. Because if you, if you keep putting it off, the time is going to come and go. It's not like that there's this unending period of time for you to make a decision. That there's a point where you've got to make a decision. And if you don't make a decision, you've made your decision. Jesus knew the hour had come and, and he submitted to the Father's will. He, he said, let us go. He was ready to go and do what God had called him to do, to die on the cross for me and you. There are times when God's will is not easy, but it's always best. That wasn't easy. But if it were not for what he did, we would not be able to go to heaven. We would not be able to be saved. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, I am the way, the truth, and the are, are without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of whose blood? Jesus. Had Jesus not surrendered to the will of God, there would be no salvation. There would be no way that we could go to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way. In, in Acts 14, 12, there is salvation in no one else, Peter said. For there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Sometimes doing the will of God is hard, but it's always best. What if Abraham had not left in faith, not knowing where he was going? There would have been no Jewish nation that gave, gave, to give us a Messiah. What if Noah had not built the ark? <laughs> then we wouldn't be here today, would we? Everyone would have been killed in the flood. What if, what if Moses had not gone back to Egypt and set the people free? Oh, there would be no Israelites Today in the land where Jesus is coming. What if Paul had not gone on all those missionary journeys? In spite of the peril, in spite of the pain. We probably wouldn't be here today. What if Jesus had chosen not to go to the cross? We'd be no hope. We'd be lost forever. No salvation, no eternal life. No forgiveness of sins. God's will is not always easy, but it's always best. Sometimes people say, listen, oh, there are many ways to God. It's woke to think that all religions are okay. Everybody's going to get to God. That's what people think. Maybe some of you have bought into that philosophy. A lot of people think, well, I can be saved by being a good person. If I live a good life, if I do good things, then God's going to let me into heaven. I mean, can, you can't imagine a God that wouldn't let good people into heaven, can you? That's what people think. That's what people say. Maybe you've bought into that. You think, if I live a good life, I'm going to go to heaven. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to get baptized. I've got a question for you. Okay? Okay? I'd like, I'd like to, for you to answer this question. If, you, if that's what you believe, if you think all religions are going to heaven, if you think we can be saved by, by living a good life, I've got a question for you. Why did God the Father not answer Jesus' prayer? Can you tell me? Can you explain that to me? When, when Jesus is sweating drops of blood and saying, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. If there's any other way... If there's any other religion, if there's any other teaching, if we can get to heaven by Mohammed's doctrine or by practicing Buddha, or if we can get to heaven by good works and doing good things, can you answer for me why God the Father said to Jesus, there's no other way. There's no other way. If, if mankind is going to be saved, if any sinner is going to walk through the gates of heaven, you must die on the cross. You must shed your blood. 
And Jesus said, Father, thy will be done. Hallelujah. God's will is not always easy, beloved church, but it's always best. Are you struggling with a decision today that's not easy? Are you struggling with a decision? Maybe you need to forgive somebody. You don't want to forgive them. Maybe you need to stay with your marriage and work out your problems instead of give up on your marriage. That may not be easy. Maybe God's calling you into ministry. And some people are telling you, oh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do ministry. You don't want to be a missionary. Maybe God's calling you. Beloved, can I tell you the truth? God's will is not always easy, but it's always best. And I pray today that you would surrender completely to the Father's will. Will you surrender completely to the Father's will? Oh, I pray that you would today. Would you bow with me? As we bow before God the Father today, God's will is not always easy, but it's always best. And maybe today in your heart you've been struggling. The struggle is real. Maybe people don't understand, but today you need to come and get on your knees at this altar before God the Father, and you need to say, God, I surrender, I surrender. Not my will, but your will. And I, I'm, I follow you. I, I, I receive your will for my life. Hey, this altar is open. In a moment, we're going to stand to sing, and I, I invite you to come and humble yourself before God. Maybe you're here today. You've never been saved. You think, oh, I'm good. I don't, have to, I don't have to do anything but just live a good life. I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. That's not true. There's only one person who can take away your sins and reconcile you to God the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. And I pray today would be the day that you would surrender to God's will for you to be saved. And if that's, if that's what you want to do today, would you pray this with me right now? Dear Jesus, I need you. I realize in my heart I can't be saved without you. There's no other way. There's no other plan. And I thank you that you willingly gave your life for me, that you took my sins and you bore them on that cross. And today I believe. Today I put my faith in you as my Savior as my resurrected Lord. Help me to turn away from my sins and live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that, hallelujah. You've been saved. And I'll be out back in a moment and meet the pastor. Let me be the first one to celebrate that with you. Come by right after this service. Let me celebrate. Let me know. If you're watching online, send me an email.